Hello everyone and welcome to this new lecture of the series on fluid electrolyte and acid base disorders. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the channel and like the videos. This series is based on my book, Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte, and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. This is the book. You can find it on Amazon. Please follow the link below. It's available as an ebook and hardcover. Both are in full color, and also there is a paperback edition. We are still on chapter 7. This is lecture 52. The chapter is hypophosphatemia and hyperphosphatemia. Today we will discuss hyperphosphatemia. Hyperphosphatemia is defined as serum phosphate over 4.5 mg per deciliter or 1.45 millimole per liter. Usually when you see hyperphosphatemia, you have chronic or acute kidney disease. Same for hyperkalemia. The kidneys have amazing ability to get rid of phosphorus and potassium for that matter. So we said most patients with hyperkalemia have kidney disease. The same applies to hyperphosphatemia. So just increasing phosphate intake in and of itself is not enough to cause hyperphosphatemia because the kidneys can excrete a lot of phosphate, up to 4 grams per day with no problems, and normal phosphate intake would be about 1.52 grams a day. So even if you double it or triple it, you're not going to have hyperphosphatemia as long as the kidney function is normal. Now the tolerable, tolerable upper daily intake of phosphate set by the uh, U.S. Food and Nutrition Board is 4 grams per day for people 9 to 70 years of age. So this is kind of the, the upper limit. Uh, most people will take uh, less, and it really depend, depends on what they're eating. If they're eating a lot of fast food, processed food, then their phosphate intake is going to be up. Now, over 50% of patients on renal replacement therapy have hyperphosphatemia. So in a dialysis clinic, usually 70-80% have hyperphosphatemia, even though they are getting dialyzed and even though we, we are using phosphate binders. Let's discuss the causes of hyperphosphatemia. First and foremost is compromised renal function. So acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease. Okay, uh, The diagnosis is easy, creatinine is up and phosphate is up. Usually you start to see hyperphosphatemia once the patients have stage 4 or 5 chronic kidney disease or they are receiving dialysis. So basically GFR is less than 30 and this is the definition of stage 4 or higher chronic kidney disease. Other causes of hyperphosphatemia include cellular release of phosphate such as rhabdomyolysis, malignant hyperthermia, and tumor lysis syndrome. Here phosphate is released from the cells and the kidneys cannot keep up. Okay, the excretory function of the kidney is not enough to excrete all that uh, phosphate. Now, it was found that admission hyperphosphatemia is a risk factor for the development of tumor lysis syndrome in appropriate patient setting. Sometimes you have increased phosphate absorption, like hyperparathyroidism like vitamin D toxicity, uh, usually the hyperphosphatemia here is not severe. Uh, some patients uh, take uh, oral sodium phosphate as a bowel preparation for uh, colonoscopy, and you can get hyperphosphatemia, especially if they have chronic kidney disease. There is a syndrome called acute phosphate nephropathy, and uh, this is described in patients taking bowel prep, sodium phosphate, and it manifests as acute kidney injury, and actually people have done kidney biopsies and have seen phosphate crystals, so it's a proven diagnosis. You see calcium phosphate deposits on the kidney biopsy specimens. Therefore, we do not recommend sodium phosphate as a bowel prep, and if patients have CKD, it should never be used. Sometimes, like with potassium phosphate, shifts to the extracellular fluid. You see that in lactic acidosis, in diabetic ketoacidosis. So initially in DKA, you see hyperphosphatemia and hyperkalemia. Then once you initiate treatment, you get hypokalemia and hypophosphatemia. 
The same effect, the same shift of phosphate extracellularly is seen in acute and chronic respiratory acidosis. Genetic causes are there, but they're not common. There is a condition called familial tumoral calcinosis. This is a rare autosomal recessive disorder. Here you have increased proximal tubular reabsorption of phosphate. The mutation is in the GALNT3 and FGF23 clotho genes. And here you have actually a decrease in FGF23 level, and you have, therefore, because of this decrease, increase in calcitriol level and subsequent hyperphosphatemia. So this is like a, the opposite of the autosomal dominant and X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets. In those disorders, you have increased FGF23 and a decrease in calcitriol level and hypophosphatemia. Here you have a decrease in FGF23, which leads to a decrease in calcitriol level and subsequent hyperphosphatemia. So this is, again, familial tumoral calcinosis, a rare disorder. There's also pseudo-hyperphosphatemia, like in hyperlipidemia, prolonged treatment with liposomal, amphotericin B, hyperglobulinemia, like in multiple myeloma, and hyperbilirubinemia. You just ask the lab to analyze phosphate with a different assay. What are the complications of hyperphosphatemia? Most patients are asymptomatic. Some patients, especially when they're on dialysis, they have itching, varitis. Uh, hyperphosphatemia can cause vascular calcifications and calciphylaxis, cal uh, calcific uremic arteriolopathy. This is a very serious condition. You usually see it in patients on uh, dialysis. I haven't seen any cases in patients who are not on dialysis. Hyperphosphatemia is a risk factor. Definitely, it's not the cause. You can see it in patients with normal phosphate who are on uh, dialysis. Uh, there is increased morbidity and uh, mortality. It's a very tough to treat disorder. Usually we treat it with sodium thiosulfate intravenously with dialysis for months and months, in addition to meticulous uh, surgical debridement and wound care. Um, hyperphosphatemia is associated with increased morbidity and mortality in the general population, not just in patients with chronic kidney disease, but this needs further study. Now, if you have acute hyperphosphatemia, you can precipitate calcium and have hypocalcemia. And once you have hypocalcemia, you can have muscle cramps, arrhythmias, hypotension, and seizures, like we talked when we uh, described the complications of hypocalcemia. How do we treat hyperphosphatemia? Well, we treat the underlying cause. So if you have rhabdomyolysis or tuberculosis syndrome, you are going to hydrate the patient. Um, if uh, you have... Uh, a patient with acute hyperphosphatemia, uh, you can give intravenous uh, dextrose and insulin like you do with hyperkalemia, and that would shift phosphate intracellularly. Acetazolamide is uh, caluretic and also phosphaturic, so uh, you get uh, a decrease in serum phosphate as well, an increase in urinary phosphate. Dialysis and continuous renal replacement therapy are very effective for acute severe hyperphosphatemia, like uh, you see in patients with acute kidney injury and tumor lysis syndrome. Now, uh, in patients with chronic hyperphosphatemia, we do a dietary restriction, we use phosphate binders. So dialysis patients are advised to restrict their phosphate intake to one gram per day or 32 millimoles per day. Now, dialysis will remove about 50%, 50 to 65% of the total phosphate intake, and then the patient is supposed to uh, restrict their phosphate and use binders. So if we use more dialysis or increase the duration of dialysis, we are going to remove more phosphate. Usually patients are not agreeable to that. Every patient I see want to shorten their treatment, not increase it. I yet have to see a patient asking me to increase their dialysis time after, what, years and years of doing dialysis. Now, what about phosphate uh, binders? Well, um, we have uh, several phosphate binders. Can, can we use them in patients with chronic kidney disease? Well, we have here um, a study 
um, that uh, used uh, lanthanum carbonate uh, for patients with stage 3B or 4 chronic kidney disease. And unfortunately, there was no significance, uh, significant difference with regard to abdominal aortic calcification, FGF23 level, or serum phosphate. So I cannot tell you that you must use phosphate binders in patients with chronic kidney disease who are not on dialysis. What do phosphate binders do? Well, they limit intestinal phosphate absorption. When that happens, you have an upregulation of the NPT2B, um, and that will increase intestinal phosphate absorption. So that will make them uh, less effective. Um, most commonly, we are going to use sevalmer carbonate. We are going to use... Uh, uh, sucroferic oxyhydroxide uh, or velforo, uh, ferric citrate um, also is a common uh, binder. Uh, less commonly used is lanthanum carbonate. Uh, magnesium carbonate is not used much in the United States. Calcium acetate is used a lot, but I would not use more than six tablets or capsules a day to avoid uh, calcium load. Calcium carbonate is cheap, but has a big load of calcium and therefore is not recommended unless you uh, cannot have uh, the patient obtain any other binder. So it's better to use non-calcium binders, so anything other than calcium carbonate or calcium acetate uh, to avoid the high uh, calcium uh, burden. Now nicotinamide, they did a study, it did not really lower FGF23 level or serum phosphate, although theoretically it should work, it should block intestinal absorption of phosphate, but it didn't work too well. Tenap uh, tenapanor um, also blocks intestinal phosphate absorption, the mechanism is novel, there was a phase 3 study, the FDA re recently declined to approve it uh, pending further studies. I'm going to end here and uh, we'll do some case studies in the next lecture. See you then.